You know, he, he toured here with a he toured here with a show. I heard he flopped like he do everywhere else. He's got a singing group called the Knockouts, and he thought because they gave him my title, he could go everywhere and draw people and get rich. And I understand he draws 80 people or maybe a thousand people in the 20,000 seat arena in London in a 4,000 seat arena. He drew 12 people. Well, he and didn't have the nerve to keep on with the show. He did a little better here. He, he got 87 at one, actually, and I think yeah. 1,041 at his I know I can beat him singing, but I don't call myself a singer. I can come here and feel every place because the people know who the real champion is. But you have been a singer, too. I mean, you had a show called Buck White, didn't you? Yes, I was in a play called Big Time Buck White and Black Militant play of problems that we're having in America. The play was a flop, but I was a hit. <laughs> you, you I lasted the play lasted six days, but the worst critics of my part was the hit. I want to get that straight. <laughs> Why is it, do you think, that that you draw the crowds uh, of all the sportsmen in the world? That you are well, a mainly, great crowd drawer. Mainly, personality has got a lot to do with it. A, a personality. Like a salesman's business depends entirely on his personality. If he's rude and unsympathetic, and and then the buyer will hope that he goes away and never come back. But very often, if the salesman is good, he can make a person buy when they don't even intend to. Same with a doctor. He might be the uh, the best of doctors. He might have many patients and give them all the medicine he wants. But if his personality is not really right, then like. Uh, his medicine won't make him feel that good, his personality will make him feel worse. But very often, a wise doctor can cure a person with word of mouth alone because they realize power of mind is needed. And a, doc a lawyer can dishearten a client on one visit if he don't have a personality of victory. Like Joe Frazier, for an example, he's the champion, they say. Number one, he don't have the personality. He can't talk. Very few boxers can get on this show and match wits with wise men like yourself. Mm -hmm. and, uh, wits wits plus, is all I want to match with you. <laughs> and very few fighters, if you take the camera on close up, you see my nose and my face. I'm not ugly. <laughs> I'm not ugly like most fighters. They have noses like that and their ears are like that. <laughs> How you feel, champ? <laughs> 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 I'm pretty. I'm a pretty fighter. And like I can, you know, I have a personality. I know how to talk to the wine heads. I have a talk for the, uh, your great Mr. Lynch here in the Parliament House. And I knew how to talk to, to uh, men like you with less intelligence than myself. And <laughs> <laughs> No, I was only joking. Just listen to the people Joke laugh. Away. Just listen to the people laugh. Just listen to them laugh. Very few comedians can do this, and that's their job. So like I'm saying, it's personality that attracts. I mean, people of all religions, like in America, I stand up for black people, and regardless of what it costs me, I speak out for what I believe. Like you got people in Ireland fighting for what they believe. I represent this. Also, the draft was something out of my religion to teach against, and this made me popular with many people. Then you got the white racists who believe in separation, such as I believe one day the black people in America must go to self, clean up self, help self, do for self. I recognize them. Then you got all the Muslims in Saudi Arabia, Pakistan, Syria, Lebanon, India, all throughout Kuwait, uh, Abu Dhabi, all throughout Libya. They all recognize me because of the name Muhammad Ali. And you add all of this up, all I represent in my confidence. I am the greatest. I cannot lose. I'm pretty. And every man believes he's the greatest. Every man will like to be the greatest. Many want to say this, but they fear it. And they see this in myself, and some hate me for it, and some love me for it. So add it all up, and we have a large crowd. <laughs> Well, Joe Frazier's ugly, he's flat-footed, he can't talk, he can't sing, he can't fight, and no he personality. No, he's a slugger, a street fighter. Why do you he's think... Not, Joe Frazier's not, don't get me wrong, Joe Frazier's good with his... He's not skillful. Joe Frazier's known for taking a lot of punches. He's not like Floyd Patterson, or say Sugar Ray Robinson, or Joe Lewis, or say Jack Johnson, Jack Dempsey. These are great scientific boxers. See, Joe well, Frazier will take five punches to hit you once. So why, do you a, think, why do you think he beat you, Muhammad, then, the last time? Well, the reason uh, that he got the decision, if you looked at my face and his face after the fight, both eyes were closed, his nose was blood, his lips was cut, his head was swollen, and he spent one month in the hospital. Did you all hear? Yeah, surely. He spent 30 days of intensive care. No phone calls and no visitors. And that's a terrible beating when you have to stay rest for 30 days. 
But he got the decision. But I'm not complaining. Next time I'll get him. I played too much with him. And plus, I find at the time I was bucking the draft system, I didn't go to the service. And I found out the three of the judges was on the local draft board. That's what I lost. <laughs> we'll come back to that if we can in just a moment. But could we sort of go right to the beginning of your career? What made you take up boxing as a child in Louisville? Well, at 12 years old, someone stole my bicycle. I went to a home show where the display cars and refrigerators and household utensils and everything. And I went there and left my bicycle outside and came out. It was a drizzling rain that night, the Saturday evening, by 9 o'clock. The bicycle was gone. I just got it for Christmas. Somebody asked me, I asked one of the nearest police officer, and they said in the basement of the same building I just came out. And a fellow named Joe Martin was training amateur boxers in a room about this size. And uh, he asked me to take out an application and learn how to fight so I can beat the fell up in joking fashion. He stole my bicycle. So, so this, I started boxing. This led you on eventually to, to uh, the Olympics. Was this your goal, as a, I mean, as a, as a child and as a young man? Did you see that the best thing you could ever do was was to be an Olympic champion. I knew nothing about Olympics when I started, nothing. I just boxed just to get on the local television show called Tomorrow's Champions. Every week is Saturday in Louisville, Kentucky, we have a show called Tomorrow's Champions. And uh, you've heard of the Kentucky Derby. Sure. That's where they have the races where I live. I live across the street from where they have a race every year. Anyway, I just wanted to get on local television, and I found out how good I was, and I kept on fighting. People say I'm conceited I talk too much, but they must have pity on me. It's hard to be humble when you're as great as I am. <laughs> and I won the Golden Gloves, the National AAU, and the Olympics. And then after the Olympics, I had all the gold medals, but no money. <laughs> so you I turned you, professional. You, you told a story uh, on one occasion about coming back uh, from the Olympics with the medal. Uh, to your own hometown. Did this make you a very big man in your own hometown? Did it completely change your life? Well, you know, like, uh, made me popular for a few days, but I wanted to do something good with it. So I went downtown. At the time, black people was marching to eat in the white restaurants, and they wanted rights to go where they wanted to. And it's just, so I said, I'll take this medal, and I'll go downtown, and I'll sit down in a restaurant. I got them on the spot now, and then I'll order something to eat. And I went down, and I had my medal on, and the lady was looking. And I said, I'd like a cheeseburger. She said, we don't serve Negroes. I said, I don't eat them either. Just give me a cheeseburger. <laughs> anyway. how, how was it, Mohammed, anyway, to be a, a, a Negro boy in the South. We uh, say black now. All right, black. Say, all, right. About you. all right. All uh, right. Did, did, is it not the same thing? What? No, Negro. We are taught that all people are named after country. Chinese are named after China. Cubans are named after Cuba. Uh, Irish people are named after Ireland. Indonesians are named after Indonesia. Japanese are named after Japan. Australians are named after Australia. But there's no country named Negroes. <laughs> All right, then let me... You understand? I understand. You're let me not as dumb let, as you look. Let me rephrase. <laughs> <laughs> Do I look that dumb? No, it's okay. <laughs> what I really mean is, did you feel that you were deprived, that you and your family and, and other blacks were second-class citizens? Did we feel it? We knew it. Not only second-class, but about... Mm -hmm. Add up all the nationalities you have on Earth, and then they come first, like... Right now, you can come to my town, and you're more free in America than I am. Even the Chinese, uh, the Japanese, that the black people help America to fight, or even the Germans. A day after the war in Vietnam, the Viet Cong will be more of a citizen than the American Negro. So, like, we might be the 50th class citizens, 60th class, if you really break it down. Second, if we was just second class, it would be all right. This is something you feel very strongly about. Strongly. I know it's the truth. Mm -hmm. I live right there every day. W what attracted you then to Islam in the first instance? The Muslim religion? Yes. It's the true teachings of Elijah Muhammad right there in America, and the power structure, nobody will challenge him. And the history of ourselves, the history of our true religion, our nationality, our names.